Here we are once again. This is Physics 2A, and it's the video lecture number six. Physics 2A video lecture six. And we'll start off with some announcements. The notes for these three lectures this week that ends Friday, April 3rd. So the note for lectures five, six, and seven will be due on Friday. And some people are sending them in more often, you know, don't hesitate. I appreciate that as well. But uh, what's, what's being required is that at the end of the week, you have a large collection of notes. Try not to put it all off till the end of the week because I've been getting some excellent, excellent submissions. You know, some people just lay out a whole raft of notes on a big tabletop and show proof of that. Some people do individual ones, so a lot of different ways to do it. Um, just make sure it's clear to me that you're taking good notes, and uh, that'll be five, six, and seven. Today is video lecture six, uh, and the topic for today is a new chapter, fluid mechanics. I have some interesting demonstrations for you this time. Wish me luck that we can pull it all off. Okay, so fluid mechanics, and we want to make it possibly through Archimedes' principle. If we get that far, that would be nice, but we have to build up very systematically. So the first part of the hour is just going to be a systematic uh, introduction of the relevant concepts. Okay. So we'll start uh, with a lot of the number things, right? But we'll start with the states of matter by which we mean solid, liquid, gas, and plasma if you're really getting fancy, okay? So solid, liquid, gas, plasma, that's out there too, okay? Solid, liquid, gas. So if you look at things in terms of their molecular structure, then in the solid, the molecular constituents are pretty much locked into place. All they can do is vibrate a little, deform a little. In the liquid, they're free to move against each other. And so we can pour liquids and things. Liquid will take on any shape. For the gas, and by the way, the liquid and the gas are both referred to as fluid. But the gas uh, phase transition has taken place and the Molecular constituents are very much farther apart. So they, they've been torn apart. Plasma, ultra hot, even more so. Okay. So solid liquid gas, that's the states of matter. And next thing we have to introduce is the concept of density. Density, we take a certain amount of mass and it occupies a certain volume, okay? A certain mass occupies a certain volume, and the density, bringing up a new letter, a Greek letter rho, so look this thing up, rho, the density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. Mass per unit volume. Okay, so that's the first thing we have to look at. And densities can vary quite a bit. Let's uh, make sure we don't forget to look at our units. So our standard units are kilograms for the mass and meters for the length. So it's kilograms per meter cubed. And of course, a cubic meter is an enormous volume in some regards. So there's a meter, we can cube that thing. It's half of this table that I'm standing behind. So there's your density. I'm going to put a little table of densities. The density of ice, and these are out of your book, there are more in the book, is 917 kilograms per cubic meter. We're going to express that as 0.917 times 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter. Ice floats on water. Okay. Density of water, this is the one to memorize, is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, or 1 times 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter. Well, we don't always have a cubic meter. 
sometimes we have smaller volumes. So as an example, I'll bring our Newton scale out here. And this is a half liter of water. Okay. Now a liter of water should have a mass of a kilogram, a half a liter, and mass of a kilogram, the weight would be 10 Newtons. So here we expect five Newtons, there you go. So two of these bottles would be one liter. And the density, a thousand kilograms per cubic meter because there are a thousand liters in a cubic meter. Okay. So there's your water. Then some random chunk of iron that we've learned to call 10 Newtons, or maybe I'll take this one here, we've learned to call one kilogram, and that should be kilogram times G would be those 10 Newtons right there, okay? So kilogram times G, that gives us the 10 Newtons. Remember the weight is a force, and this is also 10 Newtons, must be a kilogram, and you'll notice these two objects, same, roughly the same density, water, a much lower density, okay, we're occupying volume, less, more volume, less force, but here I have a good one for you, here's a bottle of a liquid, a bottle of a liquid with two little marbles floating on top, 25 newtons. Okay. I'm afraid to even be handling this thing. This is mercury. Okay. This is mercury and it has two steel balls floating on top and they're about half in and half out. So I'm going to bring this close to the camera. Just hope I don't trip and stumble. Okay. Let's bring this close to the camera and see if you can see the um, ball bearings floating on top there. We'll see when we take this thing back to the office. Okay. So anyway, very, very dense. Okay. So far, so good. So let me put a couple of those densities, a couple more densities up there. Density of water. Density of mercury which is liquid, at, it's a metal, it's liquid at room temperature is equal to 13.6 times 10 to the three, to the three kilograms per cubic meter. And you can look up in your book, there's a table of these uh, different things. You know, you always want to compare it to water. If water is one, then mercury is 13.6 times as dense as water. Steel floats on it. Steel, of course, sinks in water. You know, when it comes to lead and the density of gold, look these up. The gold, the lead is about 11, and the gold is about 19 times the density of water. This is important. You don't want to buy a gold-plated piece of lead and think you got a good deal. In this class, I'll teach you how to avoid that fate. Okay? We can do volume measurements on anything and know the difference there. So yeah, go, you can go ahead and look these up in your, in your uh, book. There are more, more densities of interest. Density of air, for instance, what is that? Well, I'll get there later. Good, so we have the density mass per volume. Last thing I'm going to say about this is uh, I'll just fit this right here in a blue note. Actually very important. We can write mass as density times volume. We're actually going to use that expression often enough. It's just cross multiplying, right? Mass is density times volume. Okay, good. I'm gonna go ahead and erase this board and move on. Okay, we'll leave this up. I'll just use the lower board today. That's how I'm set up. 
Okay, we have our density definition. And it, it holds true for solids, liquids, gases. Density definition is general in that regard. Okay. So next we have to introduce, we have to introduce pressure. Next. Pressure. You know, we use force and pressure kind of interchangeably in day-to-day -day life, but there is a difference, quite a bit of a difference, and my colleague Don Williams likes to do this for his outreach and actually just for his uh, introduction of the concept. If you press against your arm with your other hand, then you can, you know, you're using a certain amount of force that's available, okay, no problem. You do the same pressure with a finger, with a pointed finger, it's going to hurt. Okay, or I say the same force with a pointed finger, it's going to hurt, okay? So what you're feeling is the difference in pressure, and that pressure we're going to define as force divided by area. Pressure is force divided by area, and the units, always the first thing when we do a new, con a new quantity, the units of pressure are the newton per meter squared, and that's called the Pascal, in honor of someone who thought about these things first. Okay, so pressure, newtons per meter squared, that's the Pascal. I'm also going to put a note here, similar to what I just talked about in that blue box, namely that we can express the force as pressure times area, and we'll often do that. And again, just multiplying across there. Force is pressure times area. Okay, so we need some examples of pressure. And one of my favorite examples here is if I take, it's kind of an extension of my discussion there with pointing my finger in my arm. Suppose I take a 10 Newton weight, 10 Newton weight, right? I have one right here, the 10 Newton weight, and I can hold it in my hand, and that 10 Newtons divided by the area of this weight makes this comfortable to hold. Now suppose I take this 10 Newton weight and I put it on top of a nail. And now I want to hold that in my hand. Okay. You can already feel it, right? It's, it's going to point in there and hurt a bit. And really, it depends on how sharp the nail or pin is. If the thing's sharp enough, those 10 Newtons maybe drive it right through your hand, even though right here, it's so harmless. OK, so let's calculate that and see what's going on. We've got 10 Newtons. We've got a point there. The pressure, I'm going to make up a couple of good numerical examples. Pressure, which is force per area, we can say it's 10 newtons by 10 to the minus 3 meters squared. So that would be the area if the point of, a, say, a nail had a 1 millimeter diameter. Okay, 1 millimeter. So that's not that sharp. And what we're going to get is 10 newtons. And 10 to the minus 3 squared is 10 to the minus 6, but that's in the denominator. So that's going to be times 10 to the 6 per meter squared. So that's going to be um, 10 to the 7 Pascal. Okay, so that's already something. Okay, 10 to the 7. Now suppose, so this is the first example. Very road example. Let's just call this one, and we'll call this one two. Okay. So for my second calculation, I'm going to have that be a pin, a sharp needle that has a one tenth of a millimeter diameter. And in this case, we have force per area. We would calculate 10 newtons divided by 10 to the minus four meters to quantity squared. And now we're going to bring up 8 powers of 10. So that will be 10 to the 9 Pascal. 
So the, the sharper the tip is of that nail, this one right here, sharp tip, the smaller its surface area, the greater the pressure. And now you're getting into the close to the strength of materials. That's why with the really sharp point, it'll make a divot. It'll go through your hand. It'll make a divot, say, in wood and metal. It'll make a little divot as well. OK. So that's the example. Many other examples, for example, why aren't the ladies supposed to walk in their stiletto heels on some nice wood floor? Because it's too sharp. It's going to put a divot put a divot in the floor. You've heard that before. Okay. So yeah, it's one of those examples as well. It's really the same example as here with that nail. So you can calculate all these uh, as much as you want, different examples. So there's our pressure concept. But you'll notice I haven't talked about fluids and pressure yet. So the next thing we have to talk about is fluids and pressure. full of water. Okay, we have the pressure in the fluid. We've got some gravity going on. It's pointing down. Okay. Here, let's put this over here. Yeah. So a couple of things to say here. You've experienced pressure in a fluid. If you dive underwater, dive down to the deep end of the swimming pool, and you feel the pain in your ears. Okay, there's some pressure down there. Pressure is greater the deeper you go. Other thing to be said is that the pressure, and this is called Pascal's principle, look up Pascal's principle, the pressure is distributed um, evenly throughout the fluid. For example, if I were to put a, a cap on this thing and press hard on it, that pressure would be distributed throughout the fluid. The force due to the pressure is always perpendicular to a surface it's a normal force. We've talked about that before. So now let's just isolate a column of water inside this water here. Or this fluid, it can be water right now, this fluid. We're going to isolate a column, and we're going to ask, what are all the forces acting on it? And the forces will be pointing in from the side, but these cancel. That column of water isn't moving. It's not going anywhere. It's got the equal on each side. But there is what we're going to call a piece of zero pressure downward, and we'll call, we'll say F sub zero is equal to there, is equal to P sub zero times A in the way I said we could do just a minute ago. And then we're going to have a force, and I'll just leave it unlabeled, will be P times A. That'll be the pressure down here, which is going to be higher. And then acting on the center of mass of this chunk of water, if you want to look at it like that, is an mg. Mg. So now it's good old Newton's law. We're going to have P A with a plus sign minus P zero A um, minus mg equals zero, because the force down was P0A, force up with the plus sign was P times A, pressure times area is force. Let's do, let's go another step, pressure times area minus P0 times area minus density times volume, okay, density times volume, that's in your notes, and the volume is A area times H, so I've got a depth H here, and I've got a cross-sectional area A. Area A, which it's talking about right there, equals zero. So this is nice. We've got a cancellation. 
of the area, bring these two to the right side, and I have a very important law. Pressure is pressure sub, sub zero plus density G H. Okay, this is the pressure depth formula. We need it a lot. It's very crucial. It has a couple of interesting aspects. The pressure at the depth depends on the pressure at the top plus density GH. It does not depend on the size of the, um, the, the size of the region that is of submer of the region of uh, the submerged object. Okay, let me say that a little less awkwardly. So here's my example. In fact, I want to split the rest of this board in half. Okay, I'm going to work right in here. Okay. So my first example is if I were on the surface of water. Uh, here's a sailboat to indicate that we're on the water here. Okay, sailboat down here is the bottom of the water. It's at a depth H. Okay, there's something growing down there, and there's a fish swimming in here. Okay, good. So yeah, there's a boat a depth uh, above a depth H of water. Now on this side, we're going to just take solid ground, and we're standing here. This is a different picture, but we have a little tube. This could be a drinking straw worth of water that's really tall. Okay. We have a little tiny tube of water. The pressure down here is equal to the pressure at the bottom of this tube. In other words, it doesn't depend upon the fact that there's a vast ocean of water up here. It just depends upon the depth. Very crucial fact. And that comes, that's shown right here. You'll find some interesting explanations and, and uh, uh, things about this in your book as well. So the pressure depth formula. Now the second thing about the pressure depth formula is this piece of zero. What is that? Well, generally, it's the atmospheric pressure. Okay. So the atmospheric pressure we have here and we have here as well. So they're both pressing down equally on these two scenarios. The tall straw, there's a piece of zero on top. They yeah, have a little color here. Okay. So yeah, we could have had this thing filled with water. Okay, piece of zero on top there. And here we've got a bunch of water as well. Nice. So both times atmospheric pressure. It does not have to be atmospheric pressure, but in many cases we're talking about atmospheric pressure. And this atmospheric pressure is something we're not often aware of. We're just floating around in the atmosphere right now. We're not feeling any pressure, maybe a little breeze. We're not feeling a lot of pressure from the atmosphere. So the amount of atmospheric pressure would be very surprising to you. And I have a nice demonstration that, uh, let's see if we can make this work. So first of all, I'll bring everything out here. Got an aluminum can, I've got a dish here, my torch, and some tongs. Okay. So I'm going to go fill a little water in the dish, about a half an inch of water in the dish, and I'm going to fill uh, about a quarter, half an inch of water in the aluminum can here. So that's my next step. All right, a little bit of water in the dish. By the way, this isn't something you guys can try at home. You don't have to have the blowtorch. What you have to have is a gas range at home. You've got some tongs in the kitchen. You're good to go. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to heat the water in here to boiling. Heat it to boiling. 
and it takes a little patience. I'll know that it's really boiling when there's a bunch of steam coming out the top and it's vigorously vibrating here and uh, burbling and so forth. I have to be patient with that and then I'm just going to upend this can, turn it upside down and dunk it in the water. Okay, so here goes. A little patience. takes for this to boil. Boil but don't melt, right? Now there's a decent amount of steam coming out, but I want, uh, want to make sure we're successful. So when it's really steaming here, I'm going to just turn it and, you know, video camera will capture this and then we, if it works well you can rewind and watch it as often as you want. Ready? Wish me luck. Okay, that was not that was not good and you know what? It's all one take in this class, so we're gonna give it another try. Hmm. Hard to say what went wrong. success. This thing was just crushed in a split second. If you guys rewind, if you guys rewind, you can and watch it again. You can catch that. Okay. Couldn't have planned it better. So yeah, and if you want to do this at home, you saw what to do. You have to boil this thing, turn it over, and then takes us, you know, takes about a second and then all of a sudden, boom. So what happened here? What happened is the following. The can had a um, lot of steam in it, had a lot, of, it was filled with steam. I turned it over and made a seal in the water. The steam condensed, condensed to water, it left behind a vacuum in the can, and the atmospheric pressure then was just able to crush the can immediately. You can look this up, um, people do this for fun. You look, look some of these examples up online. And people will do large cans. I think I've seen one where they heated a, a barrel-sized can and were spraying it with a hose and everything and got it to collapse under atmospheric pressure. Okay, so that's a fun one. Glad it worked the second time. And uh, you know, the time of year it is now, there are no paper towels in the lecture hall. So let's see if I can... Clean up a bit. Okay, so carry on. <clears throat> yeah, 
so where were we? We were talking about atmospheric pressure. That was the pressure on top of this tube. I've got some sun coming in right now. It's all right. That was the pressure on top of this tube here. And it was just the atmospheric pressure. It is apparently considerable, considerable pressure going on there. Now, I wanted to do a couple more atmospheric pressure demonstrations now that we've seen how mighty it is. And for that, I have brought, first of all, just suction cups, as you've learned to know them. And you can pull really hard to get these to come apart. If I put them on the table here, and I bring a scale just to prove I'm not cheating. See, that's easily 50 newtons. It'll hold a whole lot more. Yeah. Suction cup, what does that mean? There is no suction here. What it means is I've pressed out the air in between them. It's essentially vacuum in between, and all we have is that crushing pressure on each side. Okay, so it's very substantial. You can imagine if these are that hard to far, oh, difficult pull apart, then this thing with the vastly greater surface area, put this on the roof of your car, you could probably lift your car. Is that an exaggeration? Calculate it and get back to me. Okay. But 50 newtons is nothing for this thing. I can, you know, the whole table you can pick up with this. And if there's no suction involved. There's simply no um, air underneath this to push back. Same here, there's no air in between these things, so it's all just atmospheric pressure. If there's air in between them, then there's atmospheric pressure pushing in and pushing out. So that's something to think about. Yeah, the atmospheric pressure here. Okay, it's always something. We're getting flooded by light here, but we'll just carry on. Okay. <clears throat> So having done this, we can get a little bit deeper into the actual measurement of atmospheric pressure. We have this, um, have this depth, pressure depth formula. depth formula and next we'll call this measuring atmospheric pressure measuring atmospheric pressure we're already convinced it's pretty substantial the suction cups so-called suction cups the crushing of the can I'd say we're already convinced atmospheric pressure so how much is it in Pascals? So the demo here, or the idea, idea is actually a reality with the barometer, but here's the idea behind the barometer. Imagine you had a long capillary and you filled it with fluid all the way to the top. Okay. So this is step one, we've got a capillary filled all the way to the top with a fluid. And then in our second step, I'll number these, one. In our second step, we have a dish of that same fluid. And we put our thumb on top of this thing and upend it and put it in the dish. So that what, is now, what we now have is this upside down capillary now, same one, it's been upended, and what we discover is that the fluid is no longer up to the top, so there's an empty space up here. It leaves behind a vacuum, just like our, our can here when the, when the liquid condensed in here, it was a vacuum and that's why it got crushed, okay? So it leaves behind a vacuum, and therefore there's no pressure pressing down on this fluid here. So we have a column of fluid. 
column of fluid, and right at this point right here, at the water line down here, P equals P atmosphere. The reason being, this is out in the atmosphere. Okay, this is on the table. Atmosphere around, so the pressure on top of this fluid is the atmospheric pressure, but it's connected to the inside of the capillary, right, because it's open down there. So that means that's the pressure at that same level in the capillary. So, and let's name this height H. So what we have is for the atmospheric pressure, which is equal to that column of height H. So that is density GH, right out of our pressure formula. No. From P equals P0 plus rho GH at depth H. P0 is zero because there's a vacuum up here. So it's just rho GH. Okay, so that's the atmospheric pressure. And if you use a mercury barometer, you have about 13.6 kilograms per cubic meter. You have 9.8 meters per second squared, and you have 0 0.76 meters. That's why a mercury barometer has to be the better part of a meter long, that thin glass tube you've seen before, mercury barometer. And there's an interesting homework problem, because once you know this, then if you were to use a different fluid in your barometer, you'd have to have a different height of the column. So this is for the mercury barometer. And uh, what we get is 1.01 times 10 to the 5 Pascal. That's quite a bit of pressure. And that's why we get these dramatic effects. So that's the theory of the mercury barometer based on the pressure depth formula and this idea here. Now you probably wouldn't want to cap mercury with your thumb, but we're just taking the ideal case here. Right, I just showed you that bottle of mercury. And uh, so now you see the significance of its density as well. Okay, so that's measuring the atmospheric pressure. And this is how we arrive at this formula. Conspiracy of good numbers. You can see on an exam, we don't need the 0 0.01. We just have 1 times 10 to the 5th Pascal. We can do nice uh, numerical examples that way. No problem at all. Okay, good. That's the measurement of the atmospheric pressure, and we had some demonstrations of it. So what I'm going to do now, I finally got to where we can talk about Archimedes' principle and buoyancy. So we needed this whole buildup to have everything in place. Okay, so the next topic is Archimedes' principle and buoyancy. And once we get through that, I think we'll have enough time, although this is running a little longer than I wanted. But we'll see how far we get. I, I kind of like to set up some of the homework problems as well because they're very interesting. Actually, in fact, before we do Archimedes' principle, let me do an atmospheric principle, uh, pressure example out of the book. And I'll assign it as well, but I'm basically going to do it right now. So. The atmospheric pressure comes from this column of air that extends from here all the way up into outer space, right? Pressure depth, if you, if you do the pressure depth formula for air, um, you couldn't use it exactly because the air gets thinner the higher up you get. But basically, you've got this column of air going all the way up to the edge of the atmosphere. And the weight of that thing for surface area is the atmospheric pressure. So, um, so I'll put here atmosphere pressure for the Earth. So now imagine we've got the Earth, the radius of the Earth. It is a sphere, 
and it is surrounded by this atmosphere. Don't think the atmosphere is very thin. If you were to draw that layer, or very thick, if you were to draw that layer, it's actually very thin. But, uh, you know, if you're, if you're here on the Earth, then you've got this column of air that goes all the way up top of the atmosphere. And the question is, can we estimate the mass of the entire atmosphere? So what is the mass the entire atmosphere okay well here's how we're going to do this force is equal to pressure times area that's just my definition of pressure okay force is pressure times area now if we want to know the mass of the atmosphere then we can say the mass of the atmosphere times g. Okay, that's the force we're talking about. That's the weight, mg. That's the weight of that column that's over your head. Somewhere there, there's a center of mass. Fine, we don't know where it is. Somewhere there's a center of mass, mg. Now, what is the pressure times area? We're going to say we have the atmospheric pressure and the area is the entire surface area of the Earth. So we're imagining we're getting this force, you know, this pressure exerting in every direction on the Earth. So we've got mg equals atmospheric pressure times four pi radius of the Earth squared, which is just the surface area of the sphere. So look at that. What are you gonna solve for? M, that'll be the mass of the atmosphere. You gotta admit, a little bit of light, a little bit of knowledge goes a long way. Because we're we don't even have to know the law of how it thins or anything like that, or how deep the atmosphere is. So yeah, solve for M. And G is known, atmospheric pressure is known, four pi is known, radius over there, radius of the earth is known, the square it. So do that and you get the you get the mass. So I'll put that in there in the homework problems as well. That's a good one. Okay. And the other homework problems I had, the ideas I had of doing were very rudimentary just to apply the pressure or the pressure formula, apply the density formula. No big deal. This one's very interesting. Okay, I think we'll run a few more minutes. We can get Archimedes' principle this buoyancy and Archimedes principle. So we have the buoyancy force and the buoyancy force is something you've all felt when you say press, say you've got a you're swimming and you have a ball or something, you try to press it underwater and you feel it push back. Okay, pretty much, yeah. And interestingly, if you had, say, a tennis ball, it pushed back a little bit. If you had a soccer ball, it pushed back more. If you had a beach ball, you might have to lie down on top of it and it still wouldn't submerge, okay? So that buoyancy force is going to increase that pushing back, you push under a push back, is going to increase with the volume of your object. Okay. So what is that buoyancy force? Let's just imagine we have a submerged object here, a bottle, milk carton or something, and now we have to have a y-axis with a y-axis, we've got gravity pointing down, we've got a cross-sectional area A, okay, and we've got a height H. Okay. 
And then the buoyancy force is going to come from the fact that the pressure down here is greater than the pressure on top. And the deeper you go, the greater the pressure is. The side forces are not going to make any difference. So here we go. F buoyancy is equal to, I'll just call one of these one and one of these two. It will be F1 minus F2. And that's going to be pressure one times A minus pressure two times A. And that's going to be P naught plus rho G Y sub one. Rho G Y sub one minus P naught plus rho G Y sub two. And in fact, if I'm going to do it this way, let's make the y axis positive in the down direction. Now, when I go ahead and do this, oh, common factor of A, P naught minus P, P naught minus P naught is going to vanish. So I'm going to have common rho times G. I'm going to have Y1 minus Y2. And I'm going to have area. And this is rho times g times the volume, because this here is a volume. I'll just write here volume. So Archimedes' principle can be stated as the buoyancy force that was over here is equal to this expression right here. Let me write it out. I've got room here. So we have buoyancy force is equal to, so F sub B is equal to rho V G. I'm writing, I'm changing the order deliberately because rho times V is a mass. A rho times V is a mass, mass times G is a weight, and we can say it is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. So this is Archimedes' principle. And we can say Archimedes' principle or the definition of the buoyancy force, it's the weight of the displaced fluid. So that's the fluid density, not the object that's in the fluid. It's the fluid density. So let's go ahead and write this. Density of the fluid, volume that's been displaced. Okay, if this milk carton were half in and half out, only half of its volume would play a role, times G. Okay, so we have a very good derivation of Archimedes' principle and the definition of the buoyancy force. Okay, so here, down here, and there is the way it's expressed in words, weight of the displaced fluid. Okay. So when they're talking about boats and ships, for example, they'll say a a boat or a ship displaces so and so many tons, they're talking about how much fluid it displaces. And that's in the what, another way of expressing the weight of the ship. Okay. okay, so what we now have to do is the following. I'm just going to take another five or ten minutes um, to set up some examples of Archimedes' principles. Running a little longer than I'd want to, but uh, yeah, we'll come up under an hour. That's not so bad. Um, make the next one shorter, okay? Good. So I'll rewrite this and we'll get a nice example. Okay. Here 
here's our application. Um, we want to measure the volume of an object. Okay, if the object is irregularly shaped, you may have quite a bit of trouble to measure its volume. You could ask how much water it displaces, but what if it's a little engagement ring? You want to know, did this thing come out of a Happy Meal, or is it really platinum? Now what? So you need to know its density, then you can look up the density of platinum, and uh, you need to know its volume to find its density, okay? So this is also how Archimedes kind of discovered the thing. So here's our setup. We've got a beaker. Let's have water in here. And okay, we're done on substrate. And here's the mystery object. Whose density we want to know. That's the ring. So what we do is we weigh it in water. So if we hook this up to a scale, there's a tension, T, there is mg. This is something we know from having weighted in air, equals the weight in air. So T, tension T equals the weight in water. Okay, that's what your scale reads. So what else we have here is a buoyancy force, F sub V. So now we just go with Newton's law as always. We have T plus F buoyancy minus mg is equal to zero. This is a static problem. So this is how we always apply the buoyancy force. First we just apply it as another force that we've learned about in a fluid context. And then we substitute T plus density of the fluid that we're in, volume of the object displaced, G minus mg equals zero. And what did we want? We wanted to know the volume easy to solve for. Volume is equal to the weight in air minus the weight in the fluid divided by the density of the fluid times g. I always try to put something like this on an exam. This is a classic application of this whole thing here. So now you have the volume of that little mystery ring and uh, since you also know its weight you can find its density. You found its volume, and density is just the mass over the volume. Okay. So again, you found the weight in air, you know G, so you know its mass. You measured it, as in my picture here, divided by the density of the fluid, which is water in this case, times G. So you found its volume, you found its volume, you went ahead and formed this quotient, mass over volume, yeah, and if it's only about two or 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter, two, uh, 3,000, that's some cheap metal, aluminum, okay, forget it. It would have to be, you know, up around 20 to be platinum, okay? So that's a huge difference. If it were 11, it would be lead that had been painted, okay, so you won't be fooled. So yeah, this is the application. This is the application that you want to be able to do. I will just draw a couple more and then we'll call it a day. Um, but this is the really important one. And you know, you draw your picture, you know there's a buoyant force there. Newton's law, you know, forces. This one right here. I'm gonna put another note that's often in applications. Remember that Use, so make use of density 
equals mass per volume, which is equivalent to mass equals density times volume. So this definition is used in different forms, okay, this cross multiplying. All right, let's see what we had here. I had a big list of problems. I'm just gonna write them all on the board. And uh, yeah, I'll consult the book here just to make sure. Okay, we're in chapter nine. And uh, the only thing we're gonna do on this section anymore is I'll, I'll calculate more examples for you. Okay, I'll do more examples next time around. But the fluid static section we've now covered. Let's see what I have been wanting for us to do yet. Yeah. I just did for you. Just include them with your notes. You're going to see I actually did some of them. So this is chapter 9. I have here 3, 4, 5, 11, and 14a. 3, 4, 5, 11, and 14a. And what you'll see if you look at these is that problem 3 I already did. That was the mass of the Earth's atmosphere. Four and five are just trivial applications of the definition, but to different interesting objects. So just mass per volume, okay, mass per volume, and uh, calculate some densities. 11 and 14a are pretty good. What do we have here? 11 is the, is the pressure and the height in a saline solution if you're in the hospital with something dripping into your arm. A very basic application, actually. It'll make you think there, so it's pretty good. And uh, we have for 14A. 14A is the definition of the barometer. Instead of using mercury, somebody wants to use red wine. How tall was the column? So these are directly in your notes, the important ones. These are directly in your notes already. Um, and the other ones are basic examples. There is no buoyancy problem here, so next time we're going to do a buoyancy problem or two or three, and then we'll move into fluid uh, dynamics. And yeah, I'm not going to take that much time next time um, because here you now we're running on full up to a full hour or so. Okay, so we're going to say this is the end of this video lecture. Take good notes. I encourage you. I've already seen some great notes. And uh, have a good look at these problems. And good. See you next time.